you were saying earlier, I'm safer in this in a smaller body. You can see the bind that these protectors are in. They want to keep you safe. They're protectors. They want to keep you safe. And the world out there, you can see the d discrimination based on body size. And, and so they are taking that in. And how can you work with them to unburden so then there can be more choice mm -hmm. in the way that they protect you? Hey, everyone. I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I am so excited to be here with my friend, Marcella Cox, to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart and triggering and upsetting. And parts of me were like, don't cry and lose it. So I think I'm pretty good today. Last week, we were supposed to record this last week. And last week I was like, I was feeling very vulnerable and very, a little bit less stable. And so I'm a little bit, I'm glad that we're meeting today. So I feel like I'm not going to lose it, but we're talking about the chapter that Marcella wrote in the All Together Us book on disordered eating. And so if anybody knows me, if you've been following the podcast, or if you read my book, I talk about my cookie eating parts and I always talk about my my parts that that love eating and especially cookies because cookies are delicious actually. Yes, they are. They yes, are. they are. They're very yes. good. So I want to talk about your chapter and and I want to talk about you and and all your expertise and but we're also just going to chat. So I'm just going to remind both of us that this is just uh I always tell people it's like me and you are meeting for coffee and maybe we both have cookies because cookies are good with coffee. If we want them or if not we can we would have whatever our system is wanting that day and sit and we're pulling up chairs and we're just talking about this really important topic about disordered eating. So that's what we're doing. How does that sound? That we're sounds, sitting up at the coffee. That, good, good. Let's grab our coffee and cookies. That sounds great. Or tea and biscuits. Yes. Yeah. If you're in England, that, yes, that works that's what too. you're having. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm like, or wine nachos. Yeah. Or cheese and crackers, maybe. Because I'm like, that doesn't cheese actually. Crackers, yeah. Cheese yeah. and crackers and wine. That also sounds nice. So parts of me like, you can't just name foods the whole time. So let's start with <laughs> you telling everybody where you are in the world and what you would see if you look out your nearest window. All right. Here we go. Well, first of all, I just want to express my gratitude for inviting me to be on your podcast. I've listened to you many years, and I'm really excited to be a guest. And you and I have chatted beforehand, and I have some nervous parts, but I am really excited to be here to discuss my two professional passions of IFS and disordered eating. And to answer your question, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area on the peninsula in Redwood City. And when I look out my window, I see a beautiful oak tree whose leaves are turning brown and are starting to fall off. And it's a sunny December day. And in this oak tree, I get to watch little squirrels come and play and eat their nuts. And last year, we actually had a hummingbird's nest in our oak tree, which is pretty cool. I would wow. sit outside on our patio and we'd watch the hummingbirds come and feed their little chicks, which was pretty magical. And today is actually a special day because it's the winter solstice. Yeah, twenty first. Twenty first. So we're recording on the twenty first. It won't be released because uh, we're going to talk about New Year, so it's not going to be released until January. But yeah, so today is a very special day, December twenty first. That's right. Yep, the winter solstice, and also the day after your birthday. That's right. My birthday was yesterday. The Happy birthday. birthday! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am. Um, I have to brag on my boyfriend Henry a little bit. He surprised me, me and Henry and my son. All he kept telling me we're going to go to this hole in the wall place, hole in the wall place, and I was like, he's making too much of this hole in the wall place. We walk into a, a hotel, and basically there are these huge igloos, igloos on like a, a pretend igloo, like in plastic with lights all around it that you can go into. 
So I walk in and I see these igloos on a rooftop, like outside on a rooftop and they have heaters and couches and chairs and blankets and like a coffee table and they bring you all these apps. So I walk in the igloo and there's four of my bestest friends. So four of my wow. best friends, Henry, my son, we had apps and it was just marvelous. I felt so loved and cared for. And so Aww. I just want to brag on them and my him and my friends. And it was great. It was a great birthday. Oh, wow, Tammy, that sounds fantastic. And how magical, an igloo? I know. It was and your friends, oh my gosh. I know. What a, an amazing birthday. Yeah, so it was a big one. We just talked about that. It was a big one. I'm 50, so I turned 50. So it was a big birthday. It was really sweet. And yeah, I'm just feeling so loved. And yeah, it was perfect. Awesome. Well, welcome to the Over 50 Club. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm going to be 50 and I have this like <gasps> panic feeling, but it's, I've been anticipating it for so long and I'm just like, it's fine. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited what it's going to bring. And something feels a little bit more not like grounded or confident or like stable. I'm using the word stable and unstable a lot lately, mm. by the way, I don't know what that's about, but yeah, something feels very like I'm 50. feels very mm. like, mm, mm, I like it. Mm, I like yeah. It. Let's talk about, let's, how would you feel if we started with New Year's? Because this is already happening. We're already hearing about diets and like, we're all going to, we're all going to pig out because it's the holidays. I heard the other girl at the gym saying she was going to do a double class at the gym because she's been eating and drinking a lot. And so there's all this, we get these messages all the time. It was all the time. Like we drink, you and I talked last week, <laughs> we talked last week and we talked about, we should have just recorded that conversation, but we just talked about, we drink this water of it's all around us. And we're all getting, mm -hmm. getting ready for the new year's and the messages that we'll get in the new year's, which is a lot of diet culture messages. Absolutely. We're inundated with these messages and without our consent, they just come at us messages about healthy eating and our bodies and, and it can be really challenging for our parts of us to be receiving these messages and we all get burdened by these messages. We get these messages really early in life. We get these messages from our culture and our families that there's a right way to have a body, right? We hear from our mm -hmm. diet culture that they're good bodies and bad bodies and good bodies enjoy advantages because they're fit and thin and young and white and cisgender and they, they're promoted throughout our dominant culture and our media and reinforced by doctors and families and there are weight loss industries profiting off our insecurities and we're seeing it with now with these weight loss drugs ozempic and the likes and then there's also if there's good bodies that enjoy advantages there's also bodies that are often marginalized in our dominant culture because they don't fit these ideals. They're black and brown bodies, they're queer bodies, they're disabled bodies, they're fat bodies. And so our culture, this dominant culture is very racist, heteronormative and fat phobic. And so we get all these messages that it's the new year, this is a chance to change your body. And this can be so hard for parts of ourselves that yeah, have absorbed these messages. And sadly, our diet and wellness culture equates a person's weight with their value as a human. It's the air that we breathe. Yeah. So here's what's coming up for me as you talk. I okay, a couple of things. One, and I hate to keep saying this, but you and I talked about this. Two things that we talked about that I thought was really has stuck with me this whole week. One is the idea of if I'm in a preferred body. So if I'm in a body that is smaller than the one that I'm in now, and this part of me says this, right? If I'm in a, if I lose 10 pounds, I'm in the body that my grandmother then makes a nice comment when I go home next week, I'm going to get a comment. I'm going to get some sort of comments on, on my body from several people when I go home. And you never really know. I don't really even know if it matters what I actually look like. There, there's going to be some sort of comments. And so we talked about this idea of being in a preferred body actually is, feels like it's equated with safety. 
right? I'm mm-hmm. safer in the world. And I have a white female body and I feel this way if I'm small. And it's one, just one variable. Like if I'm smaller, then I'm safer in the world. People are nicer to me. My family's nicer to me. People are smile when I walk by, whatever that is. And that's just mm-hmm. one variable. So what if there was more variables, right? Whether it's uh, something like whether it's a race thing or a special needs thing, or there's, there's so many variables we could have, but there's one variable, but that my system feels like this is actually how I feel more or less safe just in weight. Mm-hmm. And so this idea of safety and kind of navigating the world culturally, it goes back a long way. Sabrina Strings wrote this book a few years back called Fearing the Black Body. And she traced the roots of fat phobia to racism. And we have all these negative connotations, weight bias around being in a larger body. And we actually see it, right? There's research that shows that if you're in a larger body, um, you, you don't get the promotions or the same salary as someone in a smaller body, right? It's in the workplace. There's weight stigma. So it's discrimination. There's a discrimination that people in larger bodies experience. And your part that is concerned, it feels safer yeah, there is harm out there in the world. I love like Martha Sweezy talks about like out there, it's not always safe, but inside it can be. Mm-hmm. I also think about trauma and how trauma separates us from our wise, intuitive, loving self and getting all these messages from our diet culture about the the right way to have a body and seeing the harm out there if your body isn't right is traumatic. And when we heal from that trauma, we're able to listen to ourselves and what we want and what we think and what we feel. We're doing what's right for us right. and our bodies. Right. So two things come up for me. One uh-huh. is, is that we have part, we talked about this too. We have parts that are so blended with the diet culture message. So I have part, so internally I have parts that are so believe the diet culture message, right? It's the water I've been drinking. It's the messages I've gotten from my family my whole life. So there are parts of me that really believe that, but believe that whatever, whatever that is. So there's parts of me that really believe it. And then the other thing that you talk about in the book, the book chapter is about body image and I don't want to miss this because I thought this was brilliant. And part of me is I can't believe you didn't get this. But the idea that like my body image is really just my body. Like it's not just my body, but it, it feels like it's not my energy. It's not my smile. It's not my warmth. It's you're just looking at my body and you're judging me for just that body. But I don't, but that idea. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just thought that was interesting that there's body image isn't, there's so much more to us. This sounds so stupid, but there's so much more to us than our weight. Totally. It's part of it, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To your first point, um, you're not born into this world hating your body, hating the size of your thighs, or your stomach, or right. We're born into this world, these embodied beings and we know when we're hungry, we know when we're full, we cry when something doesn't feel right. We're in our bodies, they're fine. It's the culture, right? It's the air we're breathing that we're getting all these messages about bodies. And um, so that's the first point is it's like, this is culture. And the second is about body image and You're bringing up, oh yeah, it's just the perception of parts. It's just our self-objectifying parts. So our culture objectifies people and we have parts that also objectify others and we have our own biases, right? So you might see someone in a larger body and have some assumptions about that person. I, I love this graphic that one of my colleagues put up a few years back at a conference and she had a, a pie chart and the, and it was all just one color. And it says what you can tell about a person in a larger body. And it was, she had a, she had these things, how much they exercise, how much they eat, 
how much they, how lazy they are, right? These assumptions. And then the last one was that they're in a larger body, that they're in a fat body. And that one was the whole color. I think that one was orange. It was just the whole pie chart was just orange. That's all you can tell about a person. But we make these assumptions. We have these beliefs about bodies based on our culture. And when we're struggling with our body, it's an opportunity to do that U-turn and to get to know that part of yourself that's objectifying yourself and be in relationship to it. And that's why I love this model because it gives us that opportunity to really deeply listen to that part and get to know why it's critical of ourselves and understand what it really needs from us. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I remember... I had, I had a part up that was being very critical about my body. And I had a a friend of mine, I think I just was saying all the things that you say when you're in that part. And a friend said something like, okay, so I can really hear that critical part of you or something. And I thought, no, this is the truth. I'm saying the truth. It really took, it, it probably took me five minutes to be like, wait, what? I'm telling you the truth about my body right now. And she was like, yeah, the part of you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> And I was like, is it just, I think that's the, the power of being blended with these parts, right? Like the power of being blended is this feels like my truth right now. Like my truth is, bam, all this body critic stuff. And it's actually, no, that's a part of you. So it just such a good reminder that when these parts are blended, they, it really does feel like that's the truth. Like the truth for me in this moment is. Absolutely. In fact, and I have to lose reason, weight, whatever. There's yeah. a reason why these protective parts mobilize to disconnect us from our bodies or hyper-focus on them, right? There's a reason that anytime you have these parts that are getting extreme, there's a, we know this from IFS, right? That there's a reason why they're doing this. And you're pointing to, oh, I feel safer. I feel safer. And you can go down that path. And what would they need from you either internally to feel safer or even externally to feel safer? Do they need more community to have discussions about this and explore what it would be like to not have to diet and make your body a problem to be fixed? How would that be to make that your New Year's resolution to, <laughs> you don't see Tammy right now, but she, her, she's shaking her head. No, that couldn't be. <laughs> yeah, but what would that be like to make that your intention for this next year is to not make your body a problem to be fixed. Yeah. That brings up so much in me. And I love your, your podcast host part that was like, Tammy just made my eyes got really wide. And I was like, but that's so beautiful. And what would it be like? And I'm curious for people that are listening to this, just to think that for themselves, what would it be like next year or for this moment or for this day, for your body not to be a problem that needs to be fixed? I have parts that get scared and are like, then you're, you would gain a hundred pounds and there there would be, there'd be bigger problems and not like you're 50. And so this is so funny because it's been coming up a lot lately, but you're 50. Not people not saying this that way, but like you're 50. So make sure you're using weights and we're going for the long haul here. So we want to make sure that our bodies are strong and that we're able to use them until we're older. And I was like, oh yeah, in my world, you just, you're just trying to lose weight all the time. But so I thought that was, that's been so interesting for me to shift that. Actually, I want to be able to do the things that I do and hike and play and be so active. And yeah, so you're bringing up something that's really important that's tied into our diet culture in a way. And that's this idea of healthism. Like we have a moral prerogative to be healthy as opposed to it being a self-led decision to take care of my body and the way I'm taking care of myself. I listen to all my parts and is there harmony inside in the way I'm taking care of myself? And we, we blame people if they're not healthy, like it's their fault. And not every body is born healthy. And some bodies have genetic predispositions to different diseases. And it's just horrible that who would blame someone for that. Everybody is deserving of care, whether it's healthy or not, whether it does weights and is strong and is, (laughs) 
Right. Or you yeah. like, you take it like, oh, they don't, they haven't taken care of themselves or they don't take, you hear people say that, oh, they don't take care of themselves. And then we're all like, I, like, oh yes, it's so gross. <laughs> yeah. And we see this a lot with people in larger bodies and fat bodies, right? Just as long as you're healthy, I'm concerned about your health. It's really, if you're really concerned about health, let, let's then have a conversation about social determinants of health, which is a totally different topic. But th there are these external factors that determine our health, our access to health care, a safe neighborhood, access to fresh fruits and vegetables and clean air and all these other factors that impact our health and our, our behaviors are only a small part of that, right? We have our genetics as well, but our behaviors, how much we sleep, how we move, how we, how we eat, right? Those things can, can have an influence, but there's so many other factors. And we, we only look at this one little thing right. and that's our body and how we can change our body. Yeah, that's so true because it's not, and, and you talked about this a little bit earlier about like the, our value that, right? My value is in my body and how I look. It's not in actually whether I'm happy and I'm doing more pleasant things and I have nice relationships and I have nice connections. And but if you had someone that in a larger body and, and they had all of these things that so many of us want, positive, great relationships and connections and a satisfying, fulfilling job and purpose and enjoyment, like these things, <laughs> these things are the things that are beautiful and are attractive, right? That that's attractive to have these, have a life like that. I yeah. That it makes some... life worth living. Having, you're talking about connection and that determines the quality of our lives, our relationships. And, and we lose sight of that by focusing on our bodies and what they look like, right? It's, it can seem superficial, but then when you really are working with clients and ourselves, we understand that these issues really have deep roots and we lose what's important to us. Yeah. Um, well, or heard... to, to parts of us, we get, right. get disconnected. Good. Yes. yes. Good. What I heard as you were saying that is a part of me says, I'm just going to talk for all, all my very extreme. I, mean, I have lots of other parts, but I'm going to talk for all my extreme parts today about this. I heard a part say being in a smaller body helps your relationships like actually improves your, so it's almost, oh, okay, it's interesting. Like all these parts that have really taken on this diet culture message that like, actually, this is how you actually have better relationships. People want to be in relationship with you. Oh, this feels so good. Yeah. Oh, well, part well, of then, me then... <laughs> <laughs> And what I might ask a client who might have that, a part has that concern is, do you really want to be in a relationship with someone that the reason that they're in a relationship with you is because of the size of your body. Oh no, gross. But as I'm saying that, and you're saying that I can, and I want to talk about this a little bit more about family burdens, because that's actually what it feels like for me, right? The more of a, a, a mm -hmm. burden, sort of a, almost, I think it's a legacy burden, this legacy burden that I've heard in my mom and my grandmother, it feels more like that. This messaging and like a burden come that, kind of really came down on both sides of my family, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So when I spoke at the conference, I did a day long workshop with Jean Catanzaro and another colleague, Teresa Chestnut. And we started looking at, okay, how are we going to talk about these burdens, right? Cause we have these cultural legacy burdens. We have intergenerational and ethnic legacy burdens. And then we have our personal burdens from our lived experience. And initially we're thinking, okay, we'll make these concentric circles with the culture on the outside and then intergenerational burdens inside of that. And then our personal burdens. And then I was thinking about this. I'm like, that's not quite right because based on our identities and our lived experience, like we, we aren't affected equally by these burdens. And so what we ended up doing is more of a Venn diagram to really show how these burdens amplify each other. So you're living in this, our dominant culture, which our diet culture, your body is your worth, your value. And then your parents, it could be go back many generations have taken on these burdens as well. And then you've had your own lived experience. And so you're seeing that they have deep roots. Yeah. They're not just, um, 
from your family or from your experience and not just from the culture, but they amplify each other. It's tricky. Yeah. And you can see, you were saying earlier, okay, I'm safer in this, in a smaller body. You can see the bind that these protectors are in, right? That they want to keep you safe. They're protectors. They want to keep you safe. And the world out there, you can see the di discrimination based on body size. And so they are taking that in. And how can you work with them to unburden? So then there can be more, more choice mm -hmm. in the way that they protect you. I love that. I love that. More choice. You used your hands or to go and I thought you were going to say, you said more choice, which is beautiful, but I thought you were going to use the word space. And I thought like the sort of spaciousness and reminded me of embodiment and sort of spaciousness mm -hmm. and embodiment. And so tell me more about, you use the term in the book, restored embodiment. Tell me what that means and what that is. Yeah. And I appreciate you. <laughs> reflecting on me using my hand. And I, I do believe that when we have more space, we can have more choice, right? More space gives us uh, a chance to really listen to these parts, understand them, and make choices that are really right for us. And we talked about when we're born, we're embodied beings, right? We're embodied humans. We we cry when we're uncomfortable. We might coo when we're happy. We know our hunger and fullness. And we're just in the moment. And we live in a diet culture, which is traumatic, especially if you are in a black or brown body, in a trans body, in a disabled body, in a fat body, and even as women, right? But we, we are affected differently by the intersecting identities that we have and by our personal experience. Um, but with trauma, our parts are ho holding the score and, and they disrupt our embodiment, which is at the core of having a disordered relationship with food um, is this disembodiment. We're, we're overriding our hunger cues, our fullness cues. I'm also part of Susan McConnell's teaching staff and using a somatic approach approach helps return clients to embodied connection with their parts and also with their self energy. And so restored embodiment is restoring that birthright of being embodied. Beautiful. And so that brings up, we've been talking about body image and diet culture, and we haven't really talked about eating, which I don't know why I'm just putting in quotes, but so that idea of, and you just did a beautiful job of linking those things, right? When we're, we've gotten all these messages and then we do become, I think really, I, mean, I think I can speak for myself. I think this is probably true for a lot of people, but you really do just become really cut off from your body because there's a lot happening so that those hunger si signals and fullness signals get, and our relationship with food gets wonky. And so and I'm guessing you see that happening like with diet, like with diet culture, is that sort of what happens? I mean, we know that our parts will use food for soothing and our younger parts will use that. And then, so we have that sort of using food as coping mechanisms and, and, so, and soothing us when we're little, but, and then you throw diet culture in there. So I want to get back to the somatic IFS, but let's talk a little bit about what happens or what do you think happens that our relationship with food becomes so disordered, which I'm putting in quotes. Yeah, I think you just really named it, right? Like that, first of all, I love that you named that as children, we go to food when we're overwhelmed because food is accessible, right? Alcohol or drugs aren't necessarily accessible, right? Some of our other firefighters, but food is. And going to food when we're little to soothe ourselves or to numb out by not eating, Right, both ends. Often with clients, we'll do some kind of timeline about how they got hurt in, in life, all the messages they heard. And many clients at one point decided it wasn't okay to feel anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So they had to like tune, tune out their feelings 
And often with clients then at other points, and often it's in adolescence, that they get the messages that their bodies aren't okay as they are. And so I've cut out my heart, I've cut out my body. So what's left is our head, which is where all these diet culture messages live, where obsessions about food and all the food rules live. And so we're living in our heads at that point. And so helping clients start to become re-embodied and be in relationship to their parts is so healing. Reconnecting to your heart, reconnecting to the feelings, reconnecting to your body. I think that makes a lot of sense that the cutoff obviously happens with the heart too, right? You're cut off from your heart and then cut off from your body. So I love that. I love that. So embodying is also reconnecting to your heart. Yeah. I was thinking about the feeling like having a feeling or part having a feeling and then this idea that's not allowed or that feeling is not allowed. So then that gets exiled and there's more sort of feelings aren't, aren't allowed and they get exiled. And, yeah. and then the feeling, the good feeling that happens when we eat the cookie, then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. Hey, I have a good feeling. This creates a good feeling because maybe I am so disconnected from my heart because that's feelings aren't allowed. This is a way to have the good feeling. Yeah. I don't know what kind of family system you grew up in, Anger wasn't allowed in my family system, right? So that had to be exiled from many people I've talked to, many friends who I've talked to, they've had similar kind of experiences. Like it's not okay for women to be angry, to exile that. And it's just a feeling and it's telling us something. And we might not want to act on that feeling, but to be able to know that we're experiencing it and to express it and put words to it is really empowering. But coming back to food, what we find is, so we get all these messages around the good foods and the bad foods in our diet culture, and we should restrict the bad foods. And what we know is that often when we restrict, that that leads to the part of ourselves that that might binge or quote unquote overeat. There's also a biological process here, right? Your body is trying to help you survive in the world. Thank you, body, (laughs) right? You're talking about, okay, now my body is 50 years old. I'm a little bit older. And, And just having so much gratitude that my body has helped me survive in this world just as it is. And it's still working hard to do that. It's still working hard to do that. So when we've been restricting, there might be a biological response. I have lots of clients who... They restrict all day or they're doing the intermittent fasting or what have you. And then they come home and they binge at night. And I'm like, there's a biological reason, but there also might be these parts there. I think I've talked about one client in the book where she was restricting during the day and ended up coming home at night. She was also lonely, right? And that, so it was partly the restriction, but also partly coming home and there was no one home. And so she turned to food for company. And it was very interesting because she saw the problem as the binging at night. And people typically don't want to work with the restriction because our our culture glorifies it. Oh my God, you're amazing. I never see you eating junk food. We glorify it. And And so people don't want to work with those parts. But what happens is restrained eating, and even the idea that I shouldn't be eating these things and restrictive thinking around food can lead to binging. What I also have found is the restriction might be around food, but the binging might be around something else. It might be around overspending, overworking, overexercise, or the restriction is around something else that's That's not about food. And then the firefighter might be binging. Beautiful. I restrict my anger and then I eat all the cookies or I restrict my feelings and then I'm like, give me the whatever. So that makes so much sense. And I, I love that it's really our parts just working for us and it's like teasing out, I was talking about this. I'm like, yeah, we, it's like teasing out the diet culture, teasing out the, which I'm so glad you mentioned the good and bad food, or I'm good and bad, or I'm going to be bad today, or I'm going to be good. That good and bad messages about me and what I'm eating and how I'm eating and the food itself. I love that. 
I love how you're making that connection because with the good and bad food, when we eat the bad food, then suddenly we become bad. And when we understand the protective nature of these parts that are either restricting or binging, we can see that they're not disordered at all, that they, they are an understandable response to navigating cultural harms that are out there or our own personal burdens. Okay. So I love that. You, you told me that the other day and I've been sitting with this idea too about, okay, not disordered eating, but an understandable response. And so what do we do then with, with if people do want to lose weight or if they do think they need to lose weight or like, what do you, this is a big question, but what do you do? What do you suggest? when people are like, but I actually would like to lose a couple of pounds because my knees are hurting <laughs> mm -hmm. or I can't move. I'm not moving as much as I want to, or I'm getting older, my metabolism and hormones and yada, yada, yada without dieting. Yeah. Yeah. I never want to get into a polarization with someone's parts around this. I know that people who lose, lose weight typically gain it back. There's some research like 97% gain it back within five years plus more. We slow down our metabolisms, blah, blah, blah. And I would then want to work with the clients to understand why and are there other things that they can do if their knees are hurting to help that. There might be some strength exercises that they could be doing to help improve the muscles around the knees, for instance. The other thing that, that I encourage clients to, to do is like to find weight neutral self-care, right? Like what are the things that really help your body that's not tied to your weight? And that and having clients listen to all their parts and it being more self-led as opposed to parts led, that everyone's or most of them are on board with that, that self-care, but yeah, it's, it, it's totally understandable that we'd want to lose weight in our culture. Hearing you yes. say is let's get to know the part, right? We do this with addictions, right? Okay. I want to stop drinking. All right. Let's get to know the part of you that wants to start, stop drinking. So let's get to know the mm -hmm. part of you that wants to stop, wants to lose weight. If that's what I'm hearing you say. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Right? Cause there's a part, yeah. there's a part there probably it's because of the burdens and the diet culture and family burdens and legacy burdens and all that stuff. It wants to lose weight. And, and yeah, that's what I'm hearing you say. I said, yeah, let's get to know that one and let's get to know who else is here. And then what happens then? And we're just going to, what happens when yeah. we get to know those parts? So if you have a, if you have a, if you have a client that's what diet should I do? Do you have a, do the blah, blah, blah diet? Are you like, nope, no. There's a practice called intuitive eating. And many people in the eating disorder field follow this practice. And it's really about honoring your hunger, honoring your fullness. It feels more embodied. Movement. Oh, I think oh, yeah. there's an embodied, something embodied about intuitive eating, maybe. Yeah. Challenging the food police, stitching diet culture. Yeah. So that it is more embodied and yeah. And it's, and it's really hard to do. If you're not working on the, the parts of us that are holding the beliefs around food and bodies on helping those parts unburden. Yeah. Because otherwise I think it can be this manager led, all these manager led programs, like whatever it is, they're manager led. And so that's why they, one of the reasons why they don't work. Yeah. And intuitive eating can be a manager saying, I'm going to be eat eating this way. Yeah. Here's especially another idea. Initially, especially so our managers, like all parts are, um, right? There are no bad parts. It's just when they get extreme, we know that they need some more of our attention. Yeah. Our managers have great ideas. Like, thank God for them. Yeah. We, yeah. your man, you probably wouldn't have done this if your manager didn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Let you do this podcast with me. That's right. That's right. They help me prepare and yeah. here we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad. So what else do you want to say? What would be helpful in the time we have left? I know we only have a few minutes left. But what do you right. think people need um, to know? I guess one thing, and you started to mention this earlier about comments. I think you were talking about getting comments at the yep. holidays from yep. folks. And I've had comments made about my body. And many of my clients have had comments made about their bodies 
and either positive or negative, they're really harmful. They're really harmful. So I just want to put that out there. We hear, oh my God, you look great. You lost weight. Whatever it is, it buys into this idea that your body is your worth. And um, there's so much more to us than our bodies. And so just wanting folks to, to hear these comments that we make, even though they might be well-intentioned, can really do harm. And, and I've also had clients on the opposite end when in larger bodies and in the grocery store and people are making comments about what's in their cart and yeah, just <laughs> Tammy's eyes just widen. I know it's pretty. Can you imagine that? Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah, cause you wouldn't say that. Not that you or I would ever comment about someone's food, but you wouldn't say that to someone in a smaller body. Like you wouldn't be no. like, I don't know. It's such a good point about comments. And I feel so much is coming up for me, just like it has for this whole episode. So much is coming up in me, like remembering people making comments both ways. And I have some little small T traumas about some comments actually that I can remember very clearly that were very painful. We don't have time to talk about this, but I think we have a lot of polar polarizations with this, right? So I have parts that are like, yes, you don't ever want that to happen again. Eat more kale or be more kale. And then have other parts that are like, F you, I'm going to go eat all the brownies. So I just have, I have a lot of these F you rebellious parts that I think too, because anger is not allowed and you need to be nice. It's one way that I can be like, I'm going to go sit in my car and eat all those food. And that'll show you, I don't know what these parts are thinking, but yeah. So I have, I think that's these polarizations. I'm just putting it all out there today. Yeah. Mm. I'm so glad that you're connecting to the the impact of someone else's words and how your parts really took that in. And there's been a lot of research on weight stigma, right? Weight-based discrimination. And often it's these types of comments that get then internalized. And then we're the ones causing the harm inside long after the comment was made. But our parts take those in and yeah. believe that about ourselves. And we're, we then get stuck in that polarization. And yeah. yeah. Same thing with diet culture, same thing with the burden, right? We have parts that believe that and internalize that and then tell us that. So we have it, like you said, I love that you talked about the circles because we're getting it, we're getting it all over the place. And then we have parts that really have believed it and then they tell us it. And then we get blended with them and they feel like it's the truth. It feels like the truth. As you were saying earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's it's amazing. So thank you so much. I love the idea of restored embodiment. I love the idea of just noticing what happens when I think about being more connected to my heart, more connected to my body, and listening to these parts in Mm -hmm. like we would with all of our parts. If you weren't doing all the things that you're doing, so you know you're doing lots of things. If you weren't doing all those things, what would you do instead? This is the hardest question for me because this depends on who you ask inside. <laughs> I have hardworking managers who are like, oh, are you serious? <laughs> we got to do something else. We'd take a rest. <laughs> mm. And then other ones is, oh, if we got to do what we do, I, I would just say that I, I definitely have parts that get inspired by creativity and love to solve problems. So I'd be doing something that would want to use these interests of mine, but I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I have a really curious one that's, oh, what would I do? I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a CIA agent. I thought that would be really cool, but I don't know if, if I would ever be able to do that at this age and <laughs> this point in my life. But some sort of creative Something, something creative and maybe something invest, investigate, investigative. Is that a word? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anything else you want to say or how can people get in contact with you, find out about all you're doing? Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if folks know, I, I have two group practices, Kindful Body, which provides online therapy and nutrition counseling for folks hoping to heal their relationship with food and their body here in California. And in the practice we have, therapists and dietitians, and we're an IFS informed group practice. I'm also a co-founder of the IFS Telehealth Collective with Paul Gintner and Marielle Pastor, two lead IFS trainers. 
And we provide online IFS therapy in six states, California, New York, Massachusetts, Florida, Oregon, and Michigan. And so, you know, either ifstherapyonline.com or kindofullbody.com. And then I also say that I'm on Susan McConnell's teaching staff for somatic IFS and a colleague, LaDonna Silva and I are going to be leading a somatic IFS retreat at Red Mountain Resort in Utah in May. We just signed our contract. So I'm super excited about that. And Jean, Teresa, and I are going to be doing an IFS retreat, working with our parts around food and our bodies in Malta in 2025. And Teresa is actually hosting an IFS and eating disorder conference in Indiana in April 2024. So if other professionals are interested in this topic, uh, she has all these great speakers. Dick is going to be doing the keynote in half day. I'll be speaking as well as uh, Jean and a few other IFS folks. So that's exciting. And if you're a practitioner, Jean, Teresa, and I also have started a a Google group, a listserv for us to have some community. That's how folks would reach me. And that's a lot uh, of things. That's a lot of things. I do a lot of things. As I said, my manager's a little bit tired. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot of things. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful for this model and yeah, whatever I would do, I would hope that I would still be involved in the IFS community because there are so many wonderful people like you and our good friend, Jenna, who invited me to write this chapter. And yeah, it's just so many amazing humans that I just feel so blessed to be in connection with. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being just being you and all you do and who you are too. Thank you. Aw, thank you, Tammy. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. Those parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you. Thanks for listening.